Hello, everybody. Kimberly Rudder from Barbados here. Nice to be here. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year Happy, to you too, Kim. Happy New Year to you. Yeah. Hi, Happy New Year. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this first in our series of 2021 for what used to have been our annual conference. Um, I am Patricia Thompson, the Executive Director of the Jamaica Island Nutrition Network, and we are an NGO that seeks to improve the health, nutritional health of the population. We focus especially on the younger ones, students from the earliest ages, right up to the youth in the tertiary institutions. Because of course, if we have healthy children and youth, then we will surely have a healthier population, healthier adults to improve the productivity of our nation. Today, we revisit a previous theme, nutrition in health and wellness for greater productivity that we had some time ago, but this time around, we're looking at it from the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, today also, we wish to look at a broader role of nutrition. Many persons are familiar with um, food tasting nice or healthy food as popularized for healthy lifestyle. Um, others know about dieting, which the reference is usually to crash dieting to lose weight. But today, the broader context of nutrition means diet for eating balanced way with um, desirable eating habits and specifically um, targeted diet for the needs of the clients on a wide range of conditions. Now, during the COVID pandemic, we are quite familiar with the messages of avoiding the condition um, through hygiene measures and skills, but little is said of nutrition. So we want to highlight the role of nutrition in resisting communicable infections and also for improving the outcomes of if, you sh if an infection should occur for you. We know that the persons most affected are usually obese or those with non-communicable chronic diseases. They usually end up in hospitals. And we want to emphasize here that nutrition plays a very important role in minimizing the need for hospitalization and the associated costs with that. So we also want to highlight a particular workplace um, approach. Um, the nutrition practitioner works in many different settings. And today we are going to be looking at different work settings during the, the, the pandemic again because things have changed. If you have sessions do if you have questions during the sessions, please use the chat room to write your question and we will collate and decide at the end we're going to have a, um, a forum whereby we can ask your questions and deal with the situations you have. Uh, today I particularly want to welcome our moderator. Dr. Maria Yvonne Guthrie, 
who is a trained medical doctor having graduated from the University of the West Indies with honors in anatomy, obstetrics, and gynecology. He has worked in many clinical settings with different age groups, but is especially comfortable with children. Some jokingly call him the child whisperer as he has an uncanny ability to get children to cooperate. Interestingly, Mario also has a bachelor's degree in music, music business and management and songwriting from the Berkeley College of Music. He's a lover of the arts and also a fitness enthusiast. He's an entrepreneur and entertaining entertainer. Some of you will know of him from the morning show in Jamaica on the CBM at Sunrise, where he has been a host. So please welcome our moderator for today's session, Dr. Mario Gossery. Pat, thank you so much for, for that introduction. Uh, afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be your moderator today. We look forward to a lively, uh, bubbly, and, and productive conversation today with our speakers. So we're going to move right into the introduction of our three wonderful speakers. Today we have three people from three different walks of life. We have Mrs. Tamar Nelson, who is on the productivity side. We have Mr. Orville Johnson, who is going to be covering more of the insurance aspect. And we have Mrs. Patricia Fletcher, who is a registered nutritionist. And first I'll introduce Mrs. Tamar Nelson. She presently serves as the head and is the Chief Technical Director of the Jamaica Productivity Center. She holds an MSc in Industrial and Systems Engineering from the Rochester Institute in New York. She also holds a BSc in Industrial Engineering from the University of the West Indies, Trinidad, and is a certified Lean Six Sigma Sensei. She probably will have to tell us what that is. A certified Scrum Master, as well as a certified Energy Manager and a professional engineer. With over 20 years experience working in both the public and private sector as a business process and improvement consultant, she has developed and delivered a number of improvement interventions, which also include energy solutions and training programs in the area of productivity improvement based on lean and six sigma principles, both locally and internationally to over 250 organizations. Her experience also includes training, logistics, engineering and project management, energy conservation and management, business process analysis, and re-engineering, inventory control, strategic planning, and warehouse management. Also practical corporate management for productivity improvement hosted by Japan International Corporation Agency in Japan, to name a few. Throughout her work life, she has enjoyed influencing policy and implementation of solutions regarding growth, sustainability, and innovation. Tamara, that's very impressive. I'm going to introduce all of our speakers today. So I'll move right on to Mr. Orville Johnson. He has been in the insurance industry in various capacities for over 35 years. He joined the insurance industry as a salesman with Jamaica Mutual Life in 1977, for those of you who are wrong. He was the CEO of NCB Insurance Services from 1992 to 2003 and has been the executive director of the Insurance Association of Jamaica since 2008 until the present. He is also a commentator of financial matters and was the co-host of the Today's Money Show for almost 10 years. He's also active in community affairs and is the chairman of the Best Care Foundation operators of the Best Care Special Education Program and is a trustee of the Jamaica Medical Foundation, an outreach arm of the insurance industry. For his contribution to Jamaica, in insurance and the disabled community, he was conferred with the Order of Distinction by the government in 2016. And finally, our last speaker on our list is Mrs. Patricia Fletcher, more accurately, Figaro Fletcher, and she's a nutritionist and corporate wellness and lifestyle consultant. Also the owner and manager of the Healthy Lifestyle Clinic, the Health Profit Group since 2000. She has certification in several areas including population health management systems for wellness program development and in the art and science of reboundology. She has been the conference host and main presenter in the course entitled Developing Successful Wellness Programs for both public and private sector since 2005 for both Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago, of which she is a native. Mrs. Fletcher served as a consultant to the Ministry of Health in 2005 to 2008, 
during which time she developed the corporate wellness program design manual, manual sorry, which is presently being updated. In addition to training over 700 persons nationwide, she was the chair of the lead group for developing this course and a recipient of the Environmental Health Foundation Award for her contribution to the area of wellness. As a keen researcher and presenter on many health topics, Mrs. Fletcher has pioneered this area in, addi in addition to rebounding aerobics. She has done work for several organizations, including Nestle, Scotia, Jamalco, Red Stripe, Carimed, and Carib Cement, and has had many TV and radio interviews. She presently does work for two of the above named companies, assisting in the development of their wellness programs. She seeks to empower, inspire, motivate, and challenge persons in their journey toward health and well-being. Mrs. Fletcher has been married to Bruce, a Jamaican, for almost 37 years in two days, and four children aged 32 to, 30, to tw well, 26 to 34, right? Years of age, and is a grandmother of three. Wow, Patricia, that's beautiful. Welcome our guests in the comment, in the chat. You can give them a clap, you can give them a round of applause, however we do this virtually. And now we are going to launch right into our conversation. I actually wanted to start with Mrs. Patricia Fletcher because I wanted us to have a framework for how health and nutrition functions in the workplace. So Pat, let us start with you. Yes. What I want to know from you, what are the reasons that a company may call upon your expertise individually or as a member of the health team? Okay, uh, first they may call for a talk because I realized that in terms of healthy lifestyles, there has to be a multi-component sort of approach. So though I'm a nutritionist and I carry the banner for nutrition, I also, as you shared earlier, have several other areas that I cover. So they may want a health talk or they may want a nutrition talk or else they may want um, you know, to deal with their clients, to help their staff members to reduce hypertension, diabetes, lifestyle conditions, non-communicable diseases, or else they may have issues with their claims and uh, want a reduction and know that I've been involved in corporate wellness programs and developing, helping companies develop uh, whether wellness climate or begin developing their culture for wellness, which of course will take a time. Right, so you may, either be, right, so you may either be invited in to consult or you may actually be working within these organizations as a full-time employer. Right. Explain, explain to me a little bit about how important it is for companies to have healthy workers and the impact right. if they aren't healthy. Right, it definitely affects the bot bottom line, uh, how people eat, how their family eat and survive, and how they're able to be alert uh, productive, to work safe, to work, be healthy in their, um, in, in, in the, on the job. So a fit to work profile, take for instance for a fireman. If a fireman has an extra, or a policeman, and they have one extra weight, you know, mm -hmm. they aren't able to really perform properly, right. Right. you know, or if a person is in an environment, if it's dusty, and they uh, are having lots of allergies, you know, how are we going to help them and reduce that? So it's, it's looking at the whole person, but also making sure that the nutrition, of course, is on target, but also other aspects of their lifestyle it would be in place. So it's, it's important for them um, in terms of the impact and certainly would Im impact their bottom line. They would want to have good morale, know that and let their employees feel that they are caring for them, that they uh, are caring not only for them, but also for their families, because everybody wants to be able to go back home to their family. And you want a, a healthy and a safe environment as well. Which, which sounds wonderful. And, and what I would say, from what you've said, it would seem like the emphasis in the world of nutrition is that prevention leads to better productivity. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. You eat better, you're able to really be fully concentrated. It's interesting, and I, all, I see it almost at every workplace. After lunchtime, between 12 and 2, we, do not, we have an unofficial um, siesta time. Right. And that's because of our food content, right. how we eat. And, and the number of, <laughs> when I have um, foreign uh, managers, they're asking me, why is this phenomenon so here? <laughs> and it's the heavy rice consumption yeah. that we are having. It's right. the heavy flour consumption that we are having. They are holy for dumplings. So there, there has to be, um, you know, it, it impacts the culture and you're looking at culture change uh, and habit change, not just for the organization, but you're talking the family now. You have to drill down into the family and what are you looking at? Right. You know, because you, especially when people think that because their parent died of diabetes or hypertension, they must get it. And, and I said, absolutely no way. You know, what you have learned 95% of the time is you have learned their habits and their preferences, their tastes, you know, and so you actually repeat the same and those break the cycle. Therefore, your children also would repeat the same. Interesting. I like I like the carbohydrate induced siesta. Uh, <laughs> well, all right. So based on the type of cultural diets that we have, particularly in Jamaica, what you said is very relevant. Walk me through a little bit some of the changes that you would do for a large corporation like, say, a a red stripe or somewhere with a large employee mass, what are the kind of dietary changes you make in the canteen to create better results? Right. Um, well, apart from seeing persons on a one-on-one, -on -one, you have the high-risk clinic and you have those who may want to lose weight or to change the outcome of their uh, situations, their health conditions. Uh, in the actual canteen, one, I would do canteen awareness, but I would go into the canteen, have a look at what their menus are, look at give adding variety, wellness options, salad bars, looking at water consumption, drink consumption. There is a high soda consumption amongst the workplace, not necessarily just on the one you name, uh, but looking at how can we present uh, hydration in a different way. So infused water became a thing. Um, looking at uh, the, the preferences, the orders, and the meals are sometimes subsidized in different organizations. So you would have uh, persons really knowing that yes, they will have to choose to eat in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, make, uh, doing canteen staff education as well as doing lunch and learns and bringing greater awareness to the patrons, you know? So it's always changing the space because something as simple as when you walk into the canteen, the first, and you're hungry, the first thing you see, you want to eat that. Right. And, that and so therefore it is better to have pictures of a healthy meal or fruits and vegetables, which in Jamaica we are really very low on, is less than four percent for the in the last survey. Right. And um, so it's giving a, a subliminal message. You're calling you're calling it slimming by design is the concept, where you change also to the environment to help to inform the public as to how they should choose. Right, so, so there's yeah. a, lot of, a lot of awareness and counseling. Absolutely, and yeah. And okay. education mm -hmm. to inform the choice. All right. I want to get to COVID and claims soon, but before we get to claims, so we've informed our choice, we've made our population aware. How do you measure? Okay, well, when I go into any organization, the first thing I do would be to get baseline data. Whether that comes from the annual medical, which the Occupational Health and Safety Department would have collected, or whether I go, if, they, if I'm given a specific clientele to work with, uh, then I would collect the data. So I would collect the anthropometric data, meaning their weights, their height, uh, weight, um, circumferences, their body fat, uh, and of course, I include in that strength because sometimes not all persons want you to look at their body type and size. 
and style, you know. They right. want to focus on something else and along the way, they will improve the nutrition. So you have to also apply to the need of the person. It's individualized. So don't, you don't want to always do everything carte blanche, right. you know. You right. just want, you want to be able to still have a direct address the need of the individual and the focus because you know so that they can focus on it as well so um so that becomes uh really cr critical as well remind me of the question I'm, I'm... i was i was asking you how you measure the changes that right. so the implement how do you measure the implementation that are made right so i would do either baseline assessments and also surveys so I have a lifestyle questionnaire that I suggest and based on the issues present, I may modify it accordingly. And then at the end of a given period, whether it's a, um, generally it tends to be eight to um, the 12 months, uh, either it will be redone. Uh, so whether it's an online one or whether it's uh, um, for my clients or whether it's done in the lunchroom, uh, there will be several ways to assess and reassess. I can do quality of life as well, as well as um, climate and culture, seeing what the uptake of the meals are, if what their fruit and vegetable consumption looks like uh, over a time period of after intervention. So you know that this is happening and they would have heard the message or the information. So you want to, to do some sort of a feedback, either a satisfaction survey. So it depends on the environment. It depends on what the population, the needs of the population. And it depends on the instrument that is, is used to assess, to start with the baseline, to do that assessment. Pat, this is exactly why I wanted you to go first, because what you are <laughs> emphasizing to me now is that there is no sitting where a nutritionist can just come in for one, 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 one visit. No. It's a long-term process. It has it's been. individualized many times. Yes. And it's very different stages that progress to come to the final result. That's right. Uh, so we appreciate the work you do and the importance of, of it. Um, this makes me want to take you into claims now. Explain the whole claims thing. When you speak about claims, are we talking about when the employee from the company goes to a doctor and swipes a card for the hypertension, diabetes? That's what you refer to as the claims to the company? Yes. So, so there are a number of reasons why uh, an employee would go to the doctor. So I would go through the claims form from the insurance companies and I look for trends in the data and I would look for it over a period of time. I don't know if other nutritionists actually all do this, but I have seen and also health organizations by some of them, they don't go to the one doctor or three doctors. They will go to several doctors and they all have different names for the, or for the illness or the ailment. So if it's a skin issue, I pick up a number of the dermatitis or skin problems or, you know, and then I, or a musculoskeletal issue, it can be something like that. So I look up and, and as same, similarly, the hypertension, the diabetes, that kind of thing. Or, right. um, and so you are able to see uh, what are the issues in this organization and what is it trending over the period of time? So I have had the many multiple discussions with insurance companies uh, in terms of preparing the data so that it can be user friendly as well as uh, there can be some commonality in how we can actually find the issues for the organization right. and help them to address it. So right. when in that situation, highlighting um, the claims usage, you, you would, they would recognize, oh my goodness, we are using that much, but we have been able over time to reduce the, the claims usage even up to 46%. And so when, when you see that, where you have a number of clients not using the claims and not using their health cards, you, I, I particularly always have been pushing a health savings account, a wellness account, some sort of a wellness reward or something that can encourage the employee to choose healthy lifestyle apart from being 
or apart from using what I really call the sickness insurance, because it's for sickness. It's not really for health and the preventative, proactive type um, aspect. So you want, I, I encourage them for innovation because I see it abroad a lot. And even when I was trained, it, it was being done that long time ago, 2004. And I'm still looking in Jamaica and the Caribbean for more of that type of proactive imp implementation or intervention in the organizations so that people can be, you know, gently persuaded towards prevention and proactivity rather than just waiting to use up the health card and for their families, you know? So, so that is my issue with the um, claims, my experience with the claims. And it, it has helped some organizations over the time because some have certainly benefited and put in um, measures to help their, their employees protected. And we have seen drastic decreases. And so, um, so there is benefit to looking at the claims, even nutritionally and seeing that reduction in hypertension and diabetes. And, uh, and also for the clients, for the employees to begin tracking themselves. So we train them in tracking and monitoring themselves so that they too can know how can I get rid of this situation if it is costing me so much? And if I can maybe use that money that I'm using as a copay to, to purchase something else, um, that will benefit me. So I, I really want to put a plug here, you know, for my insurance. Um, right. Partners. Well, Pat, Pat, you created a segue <laughs> to our next speaker. Before we leave, we're, we're going to come back to you, but one final quick answer. How has um, your role changed with the pandemic, with COVID-19? And then we want to move over to, to Arvin. Um, presently, a lot more online. It hasn't significantly changed, I would say. It's just that I'm doing a lot more Zoom calls, client calls. Well, now, of course, I know I have clients in Canada and England, you know, about the place with the whole thing of Zoom. But at the same time, um, uh, and there's a lot of webinars would be how I contact and communicate with uh, persons. But I, I must say it is not very user friendly because the health does better with connection. And um, the media can further emphasize or worsen the isolation you know, and even the accountability to some extent. Maybe I'm not using it as much as I should, but um, it has, I think it has changed it to some, I take for instance, in one organization, we had to develop um, clips. So I did about nine, 10, about 12, um, three to seven minute clips on different health topics, just as reminders. So they put it, post it, on their intranet, on their TVs, in the lunchroom, in different um, strategic locations, uh, so that people can be reminded. And sometimes they would come out on a monthly basis or they would be repetitive, that kind of thing. So um, the format has changed some in terms of the presentation, but it, right, it's right, right. similar. The, the, work, the work is still getting done, but it feels totally different. Yes, it is a good. Pat, thank you so much. That was wonderful information and it really sets the tone for where we're going to move next with Mr. Johnson. So as Orville gets ready, if you're just joining us, Orville is loosely recalling him our insurance man, but he has had a wealth of experience in the world of insurance. And we just want to fire a few questions at him that basically will help us to see why we haven't seen more innovation in um, in insurance around nutrition. So let us welcome Orville Johnson. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations to Pat and her team for putting this together. Fellow panelists, boy, after hearing those interesting bits of information from Pat, I, I, I feel a bit inspired, you know. But I must tell you that it's not going to be hard to convince companies to do um, some of the wellness programs if you tell them that the, the, the cost going down by 46%, the claims going down by 46%, because the claims go down, 
the premiums will go down. Because part of what has been driving um, it, the cost of insurance is the increased cost of claims as a result of all the things we know about, the non-communicable diseases in particular, that's where most of the deaths have come. And as a result of the cost of treating these conditions, then it, it kind of sends up the claims. So one of the things I challenge you to do, and I invite you publicly here, to share some of those experiences that you have had with those companies where you have had those wellness interventions and have got great results because all kinds of things can come out of that because you save some money and perhaps you might convince a company to put on a gym on, on the property because it pays for itself. Or to, instead of just simply doing what a number of companies do where the staff members just call out and somebody you know a box of food, which is not the most nutritious type of food. And as you said, let them sleep after lunch, you know, the phrase that we call it. Yeah. Um, then perhaps maybe it makes sense to invest in a canteen and ensure that persons are eating properly with the right amounts of vegetables and, and, and fruits and all that kind of thing. Orville, I'm glad I'm glad that you entered inspired and not intimidated because I feel like <laughs> I had I'm to fire questions. I know, I'm just right? ready to duck, you I know. know. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I like I like the, the food that you've stepped out on. And I want yes. to ask you what you can do to set the stage for me. Where is Jamaica? Where is the Caribbean? What is your awareness of where we are right now in terms of innovative insurance policies, reward programs? Are we there? Do we have anything that exists? I would say not enough, but the, 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 the industry is receptive. And uh, as usual, it, it is driven by the data. And uh, that's why I, I really sincerely appeal to Pat to, to share some of that data. Our people, we, have, we have whole heap of data, you know, we have whole heap. <laughs> yes. No, 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 about her interventions in companies. Right. Because what has happened, um, health insurance is bought primarily by companies, right? Right. And unfortunately, only about 40% of our workforce has health insurance, right? And so developing a strategy for those outside. The data is there, and we know how we eat and all that. But you have to go into the various places. So the, the wider, in the wider public, the, the government is doing a pretty good job with the health and wellness campaign and the thing about sugar and they're moving that and salt and, and, and starch. Because when you start the public education, is the way to go and then the other key areas would be now the schools and the workplaces schools are very critical because if you can form some of those habits properly and then people carry it into the workplace and they, and they continue yes i agree some of those data are so up, but you you think from the, the point of view mm -hmm. I, I think we can push it yeah you think the delay is just largely due to the fact that the insurance companies have not yet recognized the importance of preventative not, not, not really, not really. And um, it's a two-way street. Companies have to also see, I believe it should be a part of the HR responsibility. And sometimes we get information, Pat sends me stuff, and I push it through to the HR people. And I don't think sometimes the HR people are proactive enough to see that part of their role in terms of the HR development totally and individually is to put things like this in place because it impacts on productivity. People are going to sleep off or get unproductive after lunch, not good for the company, and then the sick days go up and all that kind of thing. You know, so it's, it's part of the sale and everybody has to do a bit better. Number of insurance companies now, as you know, have mobile units that actually visit companies right. to do checks on persons so they are proactive, so they pick up conditions long before they become chronic and they can deal with it. But that's part of the problem we have in Jamaica, you know. People don't um, do the maintenance work. But we are open to it, and I must tell you, one of the things that I saw being discussed at the last International Insurance Conference, because we have so much use of technology, we've got, you know, called the wearables, the, the Fitbit products. What is going to happen in the future is that people who sign up and wear all these kind of devices, um, right. we'll get some kind of a discount. I think that is where the whole thing has to go through. Persons are prepared to make the, the effort in terms of um, treating health as a priority. They will see the benefits of it. Well, well, I agree with you. And um, you, you kind of answered this already. But so you would say, what would you say are the next best steps? So 
the nutrition is reaching out to the companies and yes. and then yes. and then taking it from there. I'm sure they have over the years though. So I'm sure Pat Thompson later on will will probably have some commentary on this. I'm sure, but what well, that, that would be your next best step, you think? Yeah, but not, nothing speaks that sometimes you reach them with a general program and they look at it as cost. But right. when you talk about drastic reductions, right. long, long term, long term, right? Yeah, you get people to to um to, to look up at that, you know. Okay, there have been reference to an alternative payment model, mm -hmm. um, as it per se. Some countries use this. Uh, not, what is your knowledge of it, and and you think it'd be beneficial to us? Not a lot of knowledge of it as we speak now. Right. And it's something that I think the industry is prepared to look at, but is not something that is being practiced here in Jamaica. Just for um, clarity, I saw a definition. It says the alternative payment model is a payment approach that rewards providers for delivering high quality and cost effective care. Advanced uh -huh. APMs are a subset of APMs that let practices earn more rewards in exchange for taking on risk related to patient outcomes. So it seems like it benefits the doctors and the nutritionists, right? The, the doctor, yeah, well, yes, if we could. Well, it benefits everyone in the end, I guess. In the end, everybody, everybody wins. Mm -hmm. And um, as I say, it's it's a mindset change. And one of the things, uh, one of the positive things about COVID is that COVID has created more awareness. So things like that, that, that new methodology, that new approach, it, all these things are likely to get more emphasis going forward as a result of COVID. I think once people settle down with the vaccination period through 2021 and there's some level of stability, I think health and these initiatives that sometimes have been ignored over the years, a lot of people are going to be talking about it. Because particularly COVID, a lot of persons who um, suffered COVID because they had underlying conditions, a lot of them related to lifestyle illnesses and all that kind of thing. Exactly. I believe if there's a positive coming out of COVID, is the awareness that it has built up and, and, and more persons are prepared to participate in this kind of discussion because right. they are now ready to listen in a way that they weren't before. Right. But timing, like they say, is everything. You know, so these methodologies can work going forward. A good time. Arvin, stay with us. I'm going to, I like, I like where we are. What I'm going to do, I'm not firing any more questions at you yet. I'm going to move to <laughs> our next speaker. We're going to move to Tamar and then we are going to open up the conversation a bit and then we're going to take some questions. But I do appreciate those insights. Um, as Tamar gets ready, if you're just joining us, let me just remind you of who she is. I won't give you her full bio because she's done so much. But what I will tell you about Tamar is that right now she serves as the head and is the Chief Technical Director of the Jamaica Productivity Centre. So Tamara has a wide, wide, wide knowledge base in um, project management and company interventions. So she's coming not so much from a nutritionist perspective, but from a general um, right. perspective. So Tamara, welcome. Thank you, Mario. And good afternoon to fellow panelists and participants. Yes, Tamar. All right, let us see where I want to start with you. What I'd like to ask you first, um, undoubtedly, productivity at the workplace is affected by many factors, including health factors. Um, how would you say the priority or the order of these factors have changed now that we have COVID-19 in the picture? Uh, right. How would you order or rate the importance of these different... Introduction. Uh, Are you hearing me? Yes. As part in our introduction, I said, this was a topic that we had for discussion years ago, mm -hmm. and it's even more relevant today. And I think Arvin even alluded to that fact, wherein, um, you know, it, it, it has more attention now because of the current situation of the pandemic. And uh, one of the things that, you know, we are seeing as it relates to productivity worldwide is that it has brought home the reality to executives of you know the significance that health and wellness plays on the organization and right. what organizations are now moved to do is to prioritize workers um physical and mental well-being as a matter of survival so now it's not just an adjunct or something, a program that is done. It's um, 
you know, is something that is integrated and critical to the operations of the company. So, or the organization. So what we're looking at is um, work, life, health, safety, and well-being now being inseparable, right? right? So, you know, normally you talk about work and life balance. Now we're looking at integration because persons are now working from home. Uh, so there's no canteen to go to, for example. Um, you know, they have to do their own meals. Um, the, the advent of technology means that you are on call 24 uh, seven. So it's a different approach, you know, our, our, our company is going to now invest in technology to ensure workers focus on, you know, pay attention or have that downtime that they need to recuperate. So um, one of the things that companies have been doing is to think deeply into the, de the design of programs and integrating that into work that is being done in the organization so that the entire organization can not just survive, but thrive going forward. Right, and it goes back to the, the whole definition of what productivity is. It's not just the volume of output, but it's looking also at the input. And one of the core inputs is your human factor, right? Yeah. So even the kind of, um, you know, I'm not a nutritionist, mm -hmm. I'm not an MD, uh, but I am an industrial and systems engineer. And one of the things that is core to that training is the human factor. Right, and I think even more than ever right now with this pandemic and the unprecedented changes in the workplace, the human factor is is now you know being looked at and and seen as very critical to growth, um, survival, and thriving in the future. Right. So you know you're looking at um, you know not just on health, you're looking at collaboration, engagement. Um, you know, and looking at, you know, the exposures that persons have um, to any disruptions that exist and how it impacts how they work. Um, so this is, so the health factor is now so detrimental health, right. and, and has gotten and moved up a few levels in yeah. terms of how it impacts, you know, your output, etc. So it definitely has greater priority, as you said, but it seems Absolutely. like it's a little bit more difficult to manage because people are at home. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, this is a question that maybe I'm not too familiar with myself, but I figure right. maybe a lot of companies don't have a lot of um, occupational health and safety people currently anymore, right? I mean, there's still, it's... it's let me tell you something. I, I know we have uh, in the Ministry of Labor and Social Security an Occupational Health and Safety Department, and um, they are in demand. Persons and it's a, it's a requirement that so there is a law now, right? That's being yes, passed? There, yes, there is a law being passed now. So our, our team at the ministry is working, you know, around the clock 24 7 to ensure that all aspects are in place to help to guide persons going forward in the future. But um, yes, there is definitely a high demand for those services and skill sets. And especially know that, you know, it's not just something that you're going to attach or a department, but you have to know, look at and see, all right? Um, you know, how can it be integrated in what you do? So using the tools, the technology, et cetera, mm -hmm. to help to, to, to um, guide and influence persons. Because it's not just, okay, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> It's not just a, a, a program that you sign up for, but it's something that, hey, you, you need to do this to ensure that you are here with us and you are able to be at your best. And not just for us, but for yourself and the family. So it's, it's, a, real, it's a real shift in um, mindset. And it's a different way of thinking and being. And it's, it's really approaching every, you know, Thing that comes up in the organization as it relates to disruption, how can we address it from a human perspective first? Right. right? Because realizing that 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 this is a key part of how we are able to, to do what we do as an organization. Right. Um, I will tell though you're not a nutritionist. I want you to ask <laughs> if in your any of your interventions you have had to prioritize nutrition um as as something for a particular organization 
or are there any statistics or numbers of any in, that you have re around that? Okay, well, one of the things that um, we have seen in our interventions is that there is a shift in role for like human resources from standardizing and enforcing policies mm -hmm. to um, re the re-architecture of work across the enterprise. So I think, you know, HR, persons in charge of human resources at this time have a, their stress level has gone through the roof because they are constantly they were constantly having to, to to see what's happening how they need to change how are they measuring how are they um, addressing the needs are they still being um, efficient effective are they still getting the level of output when a disruption happens you know Mario what happens is that there is a there's a um, a time that you need to respond, right? right? So there are two parts to it when a disruption happens. When disruption happens, you know, everything stops. And then it's how quickly you can start back up, right? right? And then how quickly you can, so that's the response and how quickly you can recover. So get back to where you were or exceed, exactly. right? And so it's a change, a shift, a pivoting, and, you know, it's a transformation that needs to happen. And so, you know, in, in the organizations that we look at or that we have interacted with, it's not just this transformation, it's not just a matter of increasing innovation or improving quality. It also has to include the improvement of employee well being, right? So, this is really a shift, and this is coming out of um, studies by Deloitte, their 2021 Human Capital Report. So, you know, um, Priority is now being placed on worker well-being as one of the top three outcomes of an, any given organizations to, to thrive right now in today's workplace. Right. 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 And just to, just to share with you, you see, um, you know, especially now, as it relates to health, there is, you know, um, because of the, the pandemic, there may be absenteeism. Right. Um, and there are other you know, persons may be ill, uh, they have to care for other persons, they may have to have um, to care for their children, help homeschool, you know, all of these things affect so how the pandemic, how the pandemic is now affecting general productivity. Right, right. Yeah, and, and it's are at home. Mm -hmm. And one of the statistics that I shared at the last webinar was that, um, you know, one study done in by the CDC in 2015 showed that um, you know, about 450 million more days of work each year are, are lost, right? And that has resulted in 153 billion in lost productivity, wow. right? Wow. So just to give you an idea of, of, of what, and that, that was pre-pandemic. Right. So you can imagine what it is like now, and there, therefore the need for us to kind of rethink and reshape how and what we are doing right right um tamara um well to our participants at this time we'd really love to invite you to start typing some questions into the chat if you have any questions you can please type them in now so that we can ask our presenters um questions in their various areas um this is a random question tamara how do you feel about your um workplace health and nutrition you're personal. No, we're not looking at the organization. This is you. <laughs> personal? Yeah. I'm going to tell you, it's rough. <laughs> <laughs> you bring lunch to work or you have to buy food or what? It's easier for me to bring lunch to work. Um, I can control portion sizes. I can control um, the time in which it takes to get it. I right. control the ethnic fatigue that exists at the two okay. here that you mentioned um what you call it you see you doctors carbohydrate induced i, I, I mean I, from, I may have made that up but it was siesta <laughs> carbohydrate induced siesta me and pat came it, sounds, it sounds very fabulous but um yeah so that that has been um my approach but i think with there is a constant need to again adjust everything based on what's happening because if you are moving about less um, you know, your, your, your body demands is less, so, but you're still eating the same. So that right. will really, will, will cause, um, 
you know, possible weight gain, et cetera. So you have to be balanced in terms of being active, what you're taking in, your, your um, you know, how you eat when you eat. Okay, that's important because I know sometimes working from home, even though we're at home, we are down working and forget to stop. Um, to say, okay, I need a break. I need to take a walk outside or, I, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, it's a work in progress and it is, um, it is challenging. And I know a number of persons have spoken about you know, the COVID-10 or the COVID-15 in terms of weight gain. Weight gain, right. Yes, and it, it's, it's seen all over the world. It's not just Jamaica. So um, any any intervention that companies can make to assist workers would be very helpful. And I've seen um, in our research instances where organizations are, for example, you know, giving out smart watches, um, have software that would, would um, tell them, okay, you need to get up now, you're sitting too long, right, um, right. or you need a mental break to walk outside. To come back to to boost your productivity, so there are tech um, uh, apps, etc., that companies have invested in to ensure that even when persons are working remotely and they're not seeing them to tell them, you know, you need to get up, you need to go eat, that it, there is some it kind of system in place to prompt mm -hmm. them to assist them, etc., mm -hmm. in being healthy and productive even during this time. So we have our ways to go, but it sounds like based on what Pat said and what you said, it, it will have to be individualized in the interventions and Orville as well alluded to the fact as you did that technology will also help right. to improve actually, the productivity. Actually, as it relates to the changes that it needs to be made, there are, there are like three levels uh, or even four if we take it further. You have, you have the individual, you have the team approach, and then you have the organization. And if we want to take it up a notch, then you, you you got the industry and then the national levels. Right. So there are various aspects in terms of approaches. And then there are five different environments. Pat spoke to the cultural, right? <laughs> the behaviors and norms that exist, the relational, um, what we learn from those around us, um, our colleagues, etc. what they do, the operational, which, which speaks to the policies, the processes and the systems in place. The physical, which speaks to like your workspace, um, lighting, you know, the temperature, all of that things. Right. And the virtual now with technology and a virtual workspace. So you have to look and create like a matrix and ensure that you're addressing all of these or what policies or interventions can be made to ensure that these take place. Multi-tiered, multifaceted and difficult to do, but doable. Right. And the, the fact, you know, Pat had brought out a point that is very important, that as Jamaicans, we are we need to improve, and that's the measurement aspect of things. We cannot improve what we're not measuring. So if we want to improve the health of within our organization, we need to be measuring things and measuring accurately. Absolutely. And all one of the things that we often do is to look at past data, right? We have to get to the point where the information is as real time as possible. Not last year's data that can't help us because, yeah. you know, January 2021 is different from January 2020, right? So as real time as possible, that information can then help to, to adjust how and what we do and be more um, impactful and beneficial to employees and the organization. I love that. I think that's a wonderful point. And that's how we're going to get the insurance companies to give us more nutrition money, right? All right. <laughs> that's All right. Nice. Thank you so much. Um, we have a few minutes oh, left and we do have a question. So since we do have a question in the chat, I was going to bring Pat back. But let me take the question first. Question is from Angela Miller. When a client or patient goes to the doctor, the vitals are done prior to seeing the doctor. Could the policymakers make it mandatory that the BMI is done and in the intervention done to address weight management if needs be. All right, so the policy makers make it mandatory that the BMI, body mass index, that is, which is a weight for height, is done and the intervention done to address weight management if needs be. Well, um, I'll let one of you, anyone, kid, all I'll say, Angela, is as a doctor, I do BMIs all the time. So I do them, but I'm not a nutritionist. And I intervene as best as I can as a medical practitioner with dietary advice and otherwise 
But um, I don't know if Pat, one of the Pats wants to take this question. Yeah, well, I could take it in that um, we understand that the BMI is done indeed. Um, but exactly what do you do with the BMI? Do you follow through um, in terms of referring the patient for further intervention to the nutritionist? Because a lot of persons um, don't really know what to do about the BMI, and that's why they turn to all of these crash diets. You know, um, most of the persons who come to me, for example, usually come on their own. A friend who has been would tell them, well, look, why don't you check the nutritionist? You know, in fact, if you do home visits, and one of the, the, the most common comments you get from persons who are leaving hospital and who have been put on tube feeding and so on is, but where is the nutritionist in this? Why did they take so long for you to come? Why didn't the doctor tell me up front from they were discharging me from hospital that I was and refer me, give me a referral letter for the nutrition intervention. Invariably, the nurse sets up the, the, the tube feeding and so on. The nurses don't really know how to calculate the calories. And by the time we see the patient, the patient is almost on deathbed. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so yeah. at what point you know, do the doctors refer? Shouldn't it be from the time they did the BMI and noticed that the person's weight was falling dramatically? Right. You know, so it's not just overweight. There's also underweight in this COVID time. Malnutrition at the other end of the scale is also rampant. And in my recent survey in schools during the uh, summer camp, we saw it especially for the boys. Right. You know, the boys who maintain their activity level, but who are not given extra food during pubertal growth lose a lot of weight, you know, and um, this is very, very critical to intervene at that early stage. I appreciate that you said that because the focus is always on overweight in our minds, but there is underweight and, and it depends on the stage of life, age and stage and what's going on mm -hmm. around him. Well, thank you for that, Pat. We have another question from Dean and his question is, can any of our panelists speak to the fact that we seek to improve on quality of life using integrated approaches that include nutrition and habits. How do we make these interventions while we remain mostly dependent on imported supplies of food? How can we exercise some of these options towards improving the status of nutrition in our population, especially now? All right, so Dean, you're looking at imported foods. All right, your final part, how can we exercise some of these options towards improving the status of nutrition in our population, especially now? Well, again, I could speak to that. Um, during the summer program, I told you about one of the things um, I was asked to look at was the menu. And quite often I saw that the menu was based on a lot of convenience foods. And when I thought of the situation with the farmers having excess food and um, going to waste, you know, affecting the farmer's livelihood while, you know, persons are suffering food insecurity. One of my big suggestions would look, why don't I just link you with the Ministry of Agriculture to see if we can get some of this excess food to go into the school program during the summer? And indeed it worked. The Ministry of Agriculture was very happy for the contact. So was the sponsor, you know, and we got together, revised the menu to include some of these fresh products, introduced fruits that the, the youngsters weren't even familiar with, you know, and um, that worked quite well. In fact, I have a picture on my, my, my Instagram showing where the soft drink machine was now converted into storing all the various fruits <laughs> that, that the schools received. That's you know, nice. so that's how you get the changes, the cultural changes, as you say. Yeah. And Pat made reference to, to not just, you know, speaking to the people, but to the physical environment, you know, um, where the persons are working or studying so that they will see that there is a change and you can encourage them into a different direction. Okay, thanks, Pat. Um, thanks, Angela and Dean, for those questions. Um, I want to just use moderator's privilege to ask a question. My question is COVID nutrition or nutrition as it relates to COVID prevention. We come from a culture where people love vitamins, they love to take things, they love to hear things. What's, what's, what's myth and what's truth in the world of zinc and vitamins and minerals? We're preventing anything, if at all. That's my question for you, around COVID-19. Well, certainly we will talk about um, foods, 
your sources of these vitamins and minerals and your trace elements will come from a good and colorful balance of nutrients, your fruits and vegetables, your beans and so on, your good ground provision. So, um, and also how we cook it and looking at the, the plate and, and the distribution and the proportions of food. Also, to, to that last question, I was also thinking about persons doing um, their backyard gardening, but you also have issues, areas where organizations put in greenhouses to serve their staff, you know, which is um, doable once you have some space as well. Right. But um, in terms of the prevention, um, certainly the fruits and vegetables in terms of boosting your immunity and you have your nuts and, and seeds, all of those are very important. Now, as I made reference in the last um, Jamaica Healthy Lifestyle Survey, they showed that less than 4% of our workforce is consuming the right amount of fruits and vegetables. And um, when you're talking about boosting immunity, you, we have to pause right there. So, I mean, we can do a, spend a day on what we can use, but even just using our own food and the peas and beans that we do have to get people to consume that kind of food. And also things like um, our ginger, of eating your onions and your garlic and, you know, the thyme that we can grow and, I mean, you drop it, even the moringa <laughs> that has been crazed for some time too. But boosting our immunity naturally will definitely help. The things that will increase the omega-3 in, in us and, you know, with the different types of foods, that all of those things will help. So we are looking at balance in our diet so that we can, and also making sure that we are consuming the right amount of these different um, foods to boost our immunity naturally. Because when you look even at the top 10 foods for prevent cancer prevention, it's, it's mainly vegetables. Foods come at number eight. You know, so you realize that, I mean, there are things that we can do. Right. You know, there are definitely things. And I, and I actually encourage my clients more so focus on boosting your immunity than on even looking at vaccination, whether the vaccine, when it comes and all those kinds of things. I mean, that's another discussion. But we but can do then. something for ourselves, which right. is boosting, boosting our immunity. I like, I like that you said naturally. Um, to, to all of the people who have stayed with us, we are now at the one hour mark. If you do have to leave, we do understand, but we're going to try and get in all the questions. So we're going to ask the presenters to hang around just a little bit longer. And if you'd like to stay, please stay with us as well. We have two more new questions and we're going to just take them. We have one from Carol. Before you take those questions, um, Dr. Mario, yes, I just want to interject here. Indeed, we encourage the fresh food and so on. Um, Orville said that the government is now moving on to sodium, I think it was he said. You know, we have to bring in the culture. Too many Jamaicans, when they eat their fruits or their vegetables, they douse it down with so much salt because it's fresh. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's something that we have to get used to. You know, we have to be able to, they even put um, sugar also on some fruits. You know, if some of you are familiar with the, with the um, well, the, the children call it the purple fruit because they are not familiar with the historical and so on. They put too much salt, way too much salt. You know, if you go into the market and they're selling jackfruit, you'll see they put it into a bag already loaded with salt. Yeah. You know, so these cultural habits are very, very critical. They've already corrupt, corrupted the jackfruit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, all right. Mango. Mango, eh? Question from Carol. As it relates to nutrition and health, how does telehealth influence the impact of consultation and intervention? And how are the communications and follow ups dealt with? Um, well, well, Carol, Pat alluded to it a little earlier. She was saying that she does have to do some of our consultations online now, but you can complete the answer for, for me, Pat. Well, um, how it hinders it? It says uh, telehealth influence the impact of the consultation influence. and intervention and the yeah. follow. Well, I think maybe because I'm biased, I've gotten so accustomed to meeting with people face to face. It's always so much better. 
Um, but in terms of actually me doing the measurements, me, you know, checking on whether it's the waist circumference or the body fat measure. And, uh, but we can talk and we can discuss and I do follow up calls and those kinds of things. So there is support, there is feedback, there is follow up, but in terms of um, measurements to do the checks objectively, it may not be there. Um, but otherwise, it, it would be quite similar, you know, uh, we, we set goals and we ask persons about how they feel, you know, if they even look at a, took a picture or a target address or something that they can focus on in their environment, um, that would make the difference for them. But, um, you know, yes, you know. let them set, set a target and help them to reach that goal. Mostly. And I guess if the patient has a scale and a tape measure and a right. calculator, they may or may you not. Could, so. You could instruct them if they have these things, right? If they do, yes. Then you could get some measurements. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. The next question is from Kimberly. The people on the radio are often bashing the natural foods, claiming that the soils are poor. How would the panel respond to this? Hmm. I don't know who wants to talk about this soil quality. <laughs> Maybe we need a farmer or agriculture person. Yeah. Um, I, I think this done, soil is wonderful. Yeah, we haven't done any soil tests <laughs> as such, but certainly crop rotation will help to replenish the soil. And where we can do um, the, you know, the food endings and so on and do a compost, all of those kinds of things. But um, I, because our farmers have gotten into single crop economy, sometimes we, we can think that it may be depleted and there are um, those other aspects uh, of depletion, quote unquote. But it's, you know, when we, we are not at the place where we can prove it as such. Right, yeah. I was thinking as well that poor, right. soil, poor soil could be depletion, but poor soil could also be over fertilization too. Uh, maybe, maybe it's not seen as poor, but I don't know, I was wondering. Yeah, well, they, they did use the word natural as well. So they want, they, they're hinting right. at not putting not in too much of the, that fertilizing. So right. you're either naturally going to fertilize, you know, with using natural compost material, or um, you can either do aquaponics. So I don't know what, what type of technology they would want to use, but there are ways to at least re-enrich the soil so that um, you can get as natural a product as possible. There was a gentleman doing some natural um, fertilizer as well too, um, that he was selling. So right. that is possible as well. All right, we, we have three more questions and I think we're gonna make those the final questions. And the next question is, we spoke about the workplace, but what about students who rely on meals from the school feeding program? What can be done especially to help these students in time of COVID-19? Well, that's my era, so I might yes, as well take that. Uh, <laughs> what has happened was that it kind of took the took us by surprise, you know, these students, for example, those on the past program, um, being without their input, and probably the Ministry of Education had not thoroughly thought to how they could service that that market. Um, I know in the United States they have kept some schools open where they do meal preparation and students can come and collect their meals as normal. Um, I don't know if we have the resources in Jamaica to do that. I know some teachers attempted on their own, you might have seen them being featured on the morning programs, who um, try to ensure that the children still had a means of getting some kind of nourishment. Um, they would come and they would get packages and so on, um, sponsored by different entities. Um, they, I know the, the, the private sector organization had partnered with the CVSS to ensure that meal packages went to elderly persons, persons with chronic diseases and so on. I don't know to what extent the children benefited from that. Certainly, I know I mentioned that a segment for the children. And I would love to see a continuation of that program, um, but focusing on students, you know, um, especially as I mentioned, the children in puberty, 
and, and the boys, you know, who get marginalized because if the parents don't have the means and we have seen the data that food insecurity is greater, then these boys suffer and they're at the age where they fall prey to the, to the gangs and the violence and so on. So certainly if these organizations who are trying to assist the, the vulnerable groups, um, we have to remember that children, even though they may not have as much chronic obesity and so on, they do have malnutrition and they are very much at risk, you know, as, you know, the elderly and so on. Right. So it's right. a matter of better coordination. Right. Thank you, Pat. Um, the next thing is, our uh, next one is a comment and then one final question. And the comment came from Vanessa. She's just pretty much saying that supplements cannot be equated to, to food as food contains minerals, micronutrients, so that people should be encouraged to eat food. That's from Vanessa. Thanks, Vanessa. And our final question from Kimberly is, is the quality of our food today really that drastically reduced? That's an interesting and objective question, our subjective question, but is the quality of our food today really that drastically reduced? Um, I, would, I would say I have no data to say yay or nay, but I, what I tell my clients is eat in faith, give thanks for it, and bless it, it will have all that you need. Oh, <laughs> I love that. All right, um, that was our... our Final question for this session. Um, before we wrap, though, I want to actually ask if any of the presenters have any questions for each other. And if anyone wants to ask Tamara or Will Pat anything, let's, uh, and Patric Patricia, you're involved in that as well. If you want to ask, ask each other anything about your presentations. If not, Can let I me. I have a question. Sylvia. Yeah. I don't know if you noticed um, with, with the plant material for nutrition, I've noticed it, that um, the vegetables have got sweeter. I mean, you're not adding any sugar, but they're sweeter. Like cabbage used to be a little bitter, now it's sweet. Because I think they're breeding out the goodness as well. It's not just the soil. I would like your comment. I think food technology may have to um, do and prove that. I haven't, you are the first to say, and also first time hearing that type of comment. That's very interesting. And I think that's your area or near your area, Sylvia. Yeah, yeah. But I still wanted to throw it out to see yes. if anybody else had noticed it. Because ah. the cabbage, when you go eat the cabbage without even putting any, any sugar on it, it's, it's a bit sweet. And it used to be a bit astringent when you eat um, the cabbage. So I was just wondering if, if anybody else had noticed it. And I think this might be part of the problem. So yeah, have the Boringa leaf as a vegetable. You can also have cassava leaf, sweet potato leaf, callaloo, of course, and, and, and spinach. So we need to widen what we call food. Yes. And not to be so scared of it just because we don't know, because there's enough literature to say yeah. what is fruit and vegetable more than what we grew up with, knowing. We've lost a lot of information that, that um, Africa has as to these plants that uh, grow over there as well, the tropic, tro tropical uh, that we, we can think about. Right. I do include uh, Moringa in my salads. And yeah. also sometimes when you I'm doing steam pumpkin or so, you might just right. put some moringa leaves for color. Right, because we tend to nutrition. think of it as 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 a, a herbal drink or green juice or mm -hmm. or medicine, but it's actually a vegetable. Yeah. It's you know. All right, thank you so much, Sylvia. Um at this time I am actually going to take the privilege to wrap up this wonderful session. Um, I'd like to thank our presenters, Tamar, Orville, and Pat for wonderful insights and a spirited discussion. Thank you to all of the persons who came online to participate for your questions and, and your interest. I, it's been a pleasure being your moderator today. My name is Mario Guthrie, and thank to the JINN for having me. I appreciate you thinking of me. <laughs>
Uh, I'm going to hand over to Pat so that Pat can have her final words of closing. Have a wonderful afternoon, folks. Okay, good. Thank you, Mario. Pat, Pat, you're muted. Unmute. Yes, ah, yes, wonderful. Okay. Right, right. I was just saying this has been a wonderful session and we have basically kept on target with the time. You know, we can understand it being so interesting and such a diverse set of persons. So we thank you all for having taken off time from your work or your lunch or whatever to have joined us today. And we hope that you will be with us for the subsequent seminars that will be rolled out in, in due course. We especially want to recognize the National Health Fund, who is our main sponsor for, for the, the, the webinars, the series of webinars. And we also wish to thank our technical staff. What could we do without them? Um, Nicole Adamson and Natalia Welsh, who have been the coordinators, and they were able to draw on Ashley Gokul um, in terms of logistics, and Alex Morrissey, who is of the Asylum Limited for the technical support of the platform and so on. Um, many thanks to them. They're all volunteers. So um, we have to give them a, a round of applause. Um, Gin, of course, is a charity and we are reorganizing our website to accept donations. So if you like what you heard and you feel that you want to support some of our programs, especially our school program, you will have that um, facility to be able to donate on our website, um, www.jamaicanutrition.com. For those concerned about um, continuing education, because of the diversity of the audience and the way we have been doing it, it was not possible to just get certification from one entity. So if you contact us individually to say you need a certificate, what we will do is the Registered Institute of Nutrition and Wellness Studies, is endorsed by medical associations and so on, who will endorse your credit depending on who you need to apply to to get your credit. So that's an individual thing. All right, thanks again for coming and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much for the invite. This was great. <laughs> okay. We'll be in touch. <laughs> yes, thank you. We'll be in touch. Thank you very much, Pat. The Pats. Great presentation. Good to see you again. Yes. Good to see you and hear you. <laughs> Great presentation, Tamar. Thank you. Okay. I 